Well, hi there, students. It's Mr. V. This video is going to be a virtual version of our in-class demo on detailing. Now, those of you guys who are watching this on YouTube, just know that this video is made mainly to beginners who are learning how to draw. And we're drawing in the traditional sense, meaning rulers, paper, and pencil. And we're near the end of our first unit, which is on linear perspective. We've been drilling perspective all the way since August, and we're in two-point perspective. Students have learned how to create a variety of different shapes using a variety of different techniques, and they should have a strong understanding of camera, the grid, and all of that. And so we are in the middle, actually, of our city lab. And for those of you who are my students and are just joining in, maybe because of an absence or something, uh, this is where we are up to this point. So about four days ago, we started our thumbnail series and we planned our camera. We had restrictions and then we made a bunch of loosely drawn rough little thumbnail sketches, about 12 of them. And then we chose our favorite one and that favorite one that we have, we then built a grid on a big sheet of 11 by 17 inch paper. And that grid goes underneath our drawing paper and helps us get a real feel for the three dimension side of this, you know, the which, which lines go to which axes and such. And so with the grid done, then we started on our big and middle size forms in our city. We basically took our tiny little thumbnail and we used that as a micro blueprint and then just blocked in our big major shapes then focused on middle-sized shapes, and then we looked at little-sized shapes. And so everything's pretty much squares and triangles and cut cubes and blocks and such. Today's lesson is going to explore how do we make the leap from blocks to buildings? How do we go from a bunch of sugar cubes stacked next to each other that represent blocks and squares that represent windows and doors? And how do we get that drawing up to the point of information where it looks like a building and not just geometric toys, you know, like little cubes. So uh, anyone could learn from this. Uh, there's gonna be a lot in here that covers just detailing in general and, and how to know where they go, whether you're a comic artist, a fine artist, uh, even a photographer. So, so let's dive in and take a look. So we start with an underlay, which is the drawing that has all the mistakes. It's the drawing that has all the calculations. You know, for example, here's like our, uh, cloning calculations to get where the window placement's going to go, the sidewalk tiles. We draw through everything. You would see all of your junk lines. You know, nobody's going to see your underlay except you and your teacher, and maybe your neighbor if they look over at your work to see what you're doing. And that underlay is not the art. It's what we call throwaway art. And that is just used to solve all of the problems in the art first. And with all those problems solved, we then take a fresh, clean sheet of paper and lay it over the top. That's called an overlay. And then with all the shapes visible, then we focus on detailing. So our block, we then think about, okay, what's the anatomy of a building? And what kind of things does a building have? And that frees our brain up to not really worry about where are those things going to go? Because we already know. Now we can think at, at uh, what are they? And what are they going to look like? And what techniques can I use? And so what this does in your workflow is it subdivides the whole process of creating art into chunks so that your brain is free to focus on the foundational bits. Then 100% of your attention can be sent to the next piece, which is detailing and such. A lot of times making a piece of artwork can be very overwhelming for beginners. And this approach I found works really well. When you're no longer a beginner, this process can happen all in one layer. Um, but underlay to overlay, I still use that today, even with digital art. You know, I just make a brand new layer and then draw on top of what I drew before. And then I throw away the layer that I had before. You know, it's nothing you're attached to personally. This is what you're attached to. It's the overlay. It's what you invest all of your time and energy into. And so what is actually happening to make this leap? Well, we have rectangles. We have triangles. We have squares. We have negative space, you know, areas that sink in. We have areas that protrude out, that's positive space. And then what we do is we just work it to look like what we want it to look like, meaning there was a plan in place before I even drew this. So I knew I was gonna be doing medieval cottages. And so what is the anatomy of a medieval co cottage? Well, if you've seen a lot of them, then you probably already have that in your mind as a visual library to access, but chances are pretty good based on your geographic position on this earth that you likely have not gone to a country that has this type of an architecture. So using photo reference is a big help. Let's jump ahead really quick. 
photo reference. Can we use reference for our city drawing? And the true answer is, is that we artists you know, can't not use reference. I mean, I mean, I have to use reference all the time, but as a student, your standard is a lot higher because you're trying to demonstrate your learning at this point. And what you could do in order to earn an F would be to find a photograph of a city and then just copy the camera and the perspective grid out of it, copy the shapes and forms, right? Well, that's plagiarism, that's academic dishonesty. You wouldn't do that for your math homework. You wouldn't do that for an English paper. Likewise, you wouldn't do that in your art class. So can you use a photograph for your composition? You know, where things go, how big things are gonna be, how you place them? And the answer is absolutely not. You cannot do that. You have to build that from scratch, from your imagination via your thumbnails. And remember, we're not drawing cities. These are just forms in 3D space. And if you are trained in perspective, this should be no problem whatsoever. This should be actually very easy at this point. It's usually the struggling students that resort to cheating. Now, can, again, we mentioned it earlier, can you copy your vanishing point placement and your camera? Uh, definitely not, because that shows that you really don't know why you put vanishing points where they are and doesn't show me why you made those decisions. Right, you need to be strategic and thoughtful in, okay, yeah, I'm gonna put a vanishing point here because it's going to generate convergence in this area. And I'm gonna put another vanishing point, uh, one and a half page lengths off to the right. So it stabilizes my Z2 axis, right? If you didn't understand a word that I just said, then you probably need to go back and learn those fundamentals. Now, can you use reference to define how the buildings are going to look and what the actual details are? Then absolutely. So here's like Notre Dame Cathedral, right? Never been there, never studied it intently. If I was going to draw a type of building or even draw Notre Dame Cathedral in a different angle and different perspective, the best thing that you could do as a student would be to get an image of the cathedral dead on and then translate that into two point perspective using your training, right? Uh, because I've never seen it before. I don't know what kind of detail and anatomy are in the architecture. I'm going to have to reference that. Now, will I copy the photo? Absolutely not because you can see my photo is not the same thing as my drawing. My drawing is a completely different image. It's elevated, it's facing the left, right? This photograph is not in perspective, it's facing us dead on. So that shows that um, I know what I'm doing, right? And that's what you should be able to do as a student. So the standard is higher as a student. All right, so making the leap from blocks to buildings. When you are working on your underlay, it is rough and dirty. That's where all your mistakes are. That's where all your eraser use has come about. That's where your ruler has scuffed up your pencils. Um, that's where you have got all your calculations and your scaffolds. It's foundational. There's no detail here. Uh, to the untrained, this might look like it's detail. It's really not. It's just a bunch of shapes. We have no idea what kind of materials are put to use here. We don't even know how this chimney is made or what it's made out of, right? So um, it's got big, middle, and also little sized elements. It's got all of the major forms in place. The information level could be very sparse, meaning we don't really know, uh, again, like I said earlier, what the textures are. And you're planning ahead so that you can focus on the real artwork. When you make the leap from geometric, you're going into a completely different way of thinking. So your, your hygiene should be clean and tight. Over here, this was all freehanded, right? And if you've got really good dexterity and you don't need a ruler and you've been doing this a lot, then sketch it out. Uh, but again, if you're still in that very beginner stage, a ruler is so essential for making sure your perspective is correct. But clean and tight. Over here, we're using a pen now instead of a pencil. Uh, it's inked. This is the actual art. There's no scaffolds visible, no calculations visible. There's line weight visible, which you'll learn about shortly. Uh, it uses the solutions that we had from back here in order to guide our creativity. You see, beginners oftentimes copy the underlay. That's not the purpose of the underlay. The underlay is a guide to allow your creativity to flourish. So what kind of designs will be on this deck? What is the roof made out of? How will you arrange the stones and the chimney? Those are all elements that would be very difficult to do if we didn't already have it solved in perspective here. So the amount of information in an overlay in a building is very dense. There's a lot of pencil strokes uh, in a square inch compared to this area over here. Uh, I'm focusing on all the small elements at this point, all the designs and the graphics. There's story elements in here. Now we have our figure walking in, and this is kind of a market that the guy has built underneath his deck. 
he lives where he works. There's variety, right? So there's two decks and they both look a little bit different. In other buildings, you might have multiple windows. Some windows might be open, some closed. And we're looking at functionality. How does this thing actually work? Is there a door? Does it open outward? Does it open inward? Is there a doorknob? All of these things we must consider. So let's look at this example of this building that we had from earlier. So functionality, there's a ventilation system built into this building. There is a cap on top of the building to keep rain from falling on the people's heads, rainwater from building up. There's line weight, which is a drawing technique. And before I even got to this point, I had to know what is the anatomy of a building. So I've got my scaffold already done on the underlay. Now I can go study my references and get information on building anatomy and then go and draw the overlay after that. You don't want to start on your overlay until you have the information. And you don't want to get the information until you've finished getting the basic forms all built. So the materials, we know what this is built out of. It's made out of grass. No, it's made out of brick, and we can tell because there's brick-like textures. And I suggested brick, meaning I didn't draw brick over the entire thing. It's not necessary. The, the artist doesn't need to draw and spell everything out for the viewer. Um, some of the placeholders that we had, this was just a cube. Now we turned it into a dumpster, right? Uh, the sidewalk comes from the cloning scaffold. There are three different windows. This one has the window open. This one has the curtains drawn. This one has an air conditioning unit sticking out of it. And some additional elements added in there that weren't in the underlay. Again, I did this really quick. It's a rapid sketch. I would have worked cleaner had there been uh, more time. All right, so what exactly are details? So details could be defined as the quantity and the type of information that's present in a given area meaning the information in this area of the image is completely different than the information here. Likewise, there's way more information in the center of the flower than there is on the edge of this flower petal, right? So what are the details representing? How did I wiggle my tool in order to get a specific effect, right? So these details are representing like creases and folds. The petal itself is not a detail. Details go inside of the forms. So we've got creases, we've got folds, uh, some other details would be like the thin little dots and polka dot patterns that are, that's on here. Also, there's a lot of detail using um, shading. So there's details that are trying to communicate light and shadow. Right? Where are they located? Well, there are some details concentrated in a certain spot and then less outward. What techniques were used? I used hatching and cross hatching for this. All right, let's look at a different image. So this one is completely value-based. There are really no lines used to draw this, just shadow shapes, all right? Masses of dark and light. And then this one's a mixture of both. There's lines and there's also shadow shapes used to create this. So uh, the details, they're representing the texture of the tree, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different uh, pieces of grass. The details are used to show the texture of the mushroom. Um, and also to show what this figure is wearing and what his job is. Before this, this figure was just a stick figure. Where are the details located? Well, they're located all over, but we've got a couple of focal points where it's the heaviest near the figure and what the figure is leaning back against. And then what techniques? Well, I used contour line. I used cross hatching and hatching for shadow shapes. And that's about it. Just a quick note, you will not be shading on your city lab. You will not be shading on your city lab. All right, let's look at this different style. What are, what are the details representing? Well, here's the underlay, here's the overlay. Details are showing fur. Details are showing light and shiny bits, right? Details are showing, showing uh, different textures of the wrinkliness that's on top of a guinea pig's feet. Their feet look way different than the uh, fur that's on the body. They got really short hair on their feet. Where are the details located? Well, the most details found around the face. That's where the, the widest variety of techniques are used and condensed into one area. What techniques were used? Contour line and hatching. They used hatching to show texture, contour line to show line weight, and to define the form. Where do details go and how much? So every art piece should have a focal point. That's the main area you want your viewer to look. 
that's where you concentrate all of your details. And as you fan out from the focal point, you reduce your detail amount. If I had all the detail in the tip of the flower petal and none of it in the center of the flower, the piece would look pretty weird. So also, every time you have a new layer of detail, like out here it's very light, then here it's medium, then here it's heavy, and then here it's like heaviest. Every time you have a new layer of detail, um, they stack on top of each other. So I've still got texture within the heavy zones. I've also got value and texture in the heavy zones. And I've also got tiny detail and value and texture in the heavy zones, right? And it gets more and more as you get to the focal point. Uh, and again, we don't usually see high levels of detail far away from that focal point. If you don't have a focal point, then you need to pick one and focus on that and work your way out. Likewise with portraiture, all right? The first thing that we're gonna look at on the piece is going to be the eyes. We're not gonna be looking at like the shoulders or the chin, right? Followed by the nose and the mouth. And then everything outside from that is going to be the face. The rest of it is all secondary. So the vast bulk of detail, eyes, nose, mouth, if you look inside of the eyes, there's even more detail inside of the eye. So let's look at the iris. There's the same thing happening. Some areas of the iris have heavy details. Some have middle, some have uh, almost none, right? So you're working in threes almost with your details. So um, in your heavy area zones, that's what you want to do is get detail within detail, stack them on top of each other. Uh, even with a mech drawing, for example, all the heavy details are focused in the cockpit and the front face of this robot. And then the secondary detail areas, you know, that uh, where it's like medium level detail, that's on, well, what parts of the body do what? So that'd be like the arms and the torso and such. And then the least amount of detail would be in areas that are furthest away from us and less essential, you know, the side and the back of the robot and, and all that. So hands are very expressive. There's gonna be a lot of detail there. Areas where the arms connect and we actually have to see how these things work. You know, that's gonna have a lot of detail. Same with the pelvis, right? And then the front of this robot. Let's look at a house, all right? So the front of the house is gonna have the most detail. Um, so then the sides, which are closest to us, will have medium. And then you see there's really not much detail uh, to show on the roof. OK, um, if the story is to communicate something happening, you know, like, let's say a meteor goes through the roof, then, yeah, I'm going to have a lot of detail in that area because that's going to be the focal point. And I might ignore some of these areas, too. But um, the front faces of these buildings are going to capture the vast majority of our attention. So let's uh, take this now and apply it to our building that we looked at earlier. So you see the front of the building is going to have the most attention because that's where the customers come and go. That's where people walk along the street. That's what people are going to see the most often bits and pieces of. All right, let's take a look at this house. So the front of this building has the most attention. That's where you walk in. It's got the most structural attention. And then there's also some story driven elements, which is going to be where this guy's market is at. So we're going to have a second amount of detail here and then less and less in the other areas. Okay, don't overdo it, okay? You can overdo detail, big time. And right here, there is really no focal point in this image. And the reason why is because it's context is everything. The purpose of this image was to create a studio asset, a turnaround of a robot design. And what a turnaround is, is something that goes to a 3D modeler. And their job is to take your drawing and make a three-dimensional model of it. And so you need to have detail throughout the entire piece to spell everything out. And because another person has to be able to do their job based on your drawing. So, so no, I would not recommend a student fill everything up in their piece unless that was the objective, in which case this was the objective. All right, so looking at reference again, beginners oftentimes struggle when using reference. When we look at a window, we usually could be, or you know, a window, a car, a building, anything, right? It's easy for the beginner to become intimidated. And so they generally only see the outside of a thing rather than contemplating the interior and how it's actually structured. So for the beginner, what I typically recommend is focus on the big to middle to little, just like the exercise that we did earlier this year. So that we know that this window is a single rectangle, but our drawing is not yet a window, if that makes sense, all right? Uh, now we know that there is a frame around this window. So I'm looking at middle size shapes. And so I will put a second rectangle inside the window. It's still not a window yet. It's just a rectangle inside of a rectangle, all right? We don't even have all the form down. 
Now I notice that the window is divided into two separate window panes and there is a sill on the outside. I'm going to add those here. And there's also a third frame on the inside, right? Which is what holds the glass in. So I've included that as well. Now the anatomy resembles the start of a window. There's still more that we would have to add. If our assignment was just to draw this window, we still have to capture what are the materials, what is the state of the window in? Is it new? Is it old? Right? But now because we've been able to take our reference apart one step at a time, now we can approach it with detail. Okay? Well, how do you draw details? Well, for us beginners, we're going to focus on contour lines. You saw a lot of examples of artwork earlier that used shading and shadow shapes and all of that. Again, we are not shading in this lab. That's for its own assignment, and we're going to get there when we get there. But for now, we're going to use something very basic. Those are called contour lines. That is French for outline. A line actually does not exist in, in nature at all. It's a symbol that humans created, just like numbers and letters. And I have many other videos on this channel that you can reference. Um, for example, line to detail. And another video is called a basic understanding of line. I would recommend that you review those as well. Uh, in it, I show a wide variety of different techniques that are used to suggest different textures and surfaces. So contour is basically a line in the most traditional sense, like if you're going to write your name or something, that kind of a line. And so there are many different ways to do contours. I'm just going to touch on it in this class and then, um, you know, for this lesson. And then after the lesson, I'll demonstrate that um, outside of this video. So a contour is like if you would draw the outside of something. If you want to draw like a raindrop, you just go doop, draw it in the shape of a raindrop. Okay. Um, broken contour is when you draw a line and then your tool lifts up a little bit and then goes back down and keeps moving along the direction that line was going. And it breaks and it hits and it breaks and it breaks and it hits. Sometimes you would break a contour if you've got a form on top of another, right? And you have then another form behind it. You probably don't want those lines to touch. Otherwise, you might confuse the viewer's brain, all right? Uh, they might think that this is one form instead of a separate one. So you leave a little gap in between. Uh, cross contour is when you draw lines that go across a thing and it shows form relationships. So for example, uh, all of these contours curve, but they curve in such a way where it gives the illusion that we've got like this lip or this ledge right here, right? That this could all be one thing and that it is defined by its many lines that go across it. Kind of like if you're going to drape a spaghetti noodle over your finger and then you do it with another noodle and another and another. Now get rid of your hand and imagine those noodles are floating in space, they would conform to the shape of your finger and they would resemble a finger-like shape. All right? Hatching is when you use many small strokes next to each other. Now, hatches can all go the same direction. Hatches, which would be like great for like rough surfaces. Um, hatches can vary in direction, which is great for fur. They can clump and cluster. They can get thick and they can get thin. They can curve, but they generally rest on an axis and they follow a set direction. They don't just float in space, right? It's restrained control. You know, they go from small and then to wide or wide to small. Um, so, so hatching is a technique that you would learn in a drawing class. This will be your exposure to it here. Continuous line is how you draw like organic things. Uh, for example, like water or tree bark, things that are controlled chaos. You keep your tool down on the surface and generally move your arm in the method that uh, it would actually happen as if, say, you were feeling the actual surface. So you go up to a tree, there would be parts that would be straight, there would be parts that sink in and out. Well, that's actually the direction that you would move your tool. I do not recommend that for detailing until you're advanced. Um, but continuous line is a method that works great for water, uh, wrinkly skin, like on a tortoise's face, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Line weight, we'll touch on that in a little bit. And then intersecting line, eh, we touched a little bit here, but again, this would be used mostly for organic shapes, you know, living things, vein structures, noodles, hair, that kind of stuff. All right, so again, here's a really helpful tool that'll work for you beginners. Let's say you got a tree and you want to define the details in the tree. Uh, to do that, I'm going to use some form of intersecting lines. Uh, so over here, 
beginner students typically make little squiggly wigglies and then say, oh, I made tree bark. And that's actually not the case. So go back to your knowledge of foreshortening. All right. Foreshortening is when, let's say you got a cylinder, when a form turns away from your line of sight, when it turns under, all of the details start to add up on top of each other, which means if you've got a rounded or a curved form, it really looks cool if you bunch most of your details around the edges of that form. So let's look over at this tree on the right. Rather than put your squiggly wigglies all over the place randomly, bunch them generally nearest the edges and then straighten them out or broaden them out, widen them apart from each other as you get towards the middle and give the eye room to rest. You know, we don't fill the whole thing up with detail, just the essential parts. And if you do that, it makes it feel as if it's curving. You know, if there's like a three-dimensional volume to it, you're given that illusion of perspective. Also, if we look at the ground here, the same thing could happen. If we start to bunch up and compress our flat horizontal lines, uh, the farther away they get from us, the more compressed they get, the closer they get to us, the more spaced out. So again, warning, do not attempt to add shadow to your city lab. Read your lab directions. We will be using a drafting marker in the future, though we're not going to be doing it now. So next, we're going to shift gears a little bit into the process. So what is inking? So you guys are going to be using an inking pen. You're going to be drawing your overlay in pencil first, right? So overlay, remember, is the artwork. It's got the detail. It's got all the hard work in it. And then you're going to attack it with a technical pen. You're going to ink every single line that you made. And then we will erase, and all that will remain will be the ink. So inking is the process of making penciled lines permanent by using a non-erasable medium such as pen. Here we got the pencil drawing. Here we got the inking in process. Erase the pencils. All you're left with is a clean inked piece. Now, one thing to be mindful of is once you get rid of all the pencil lines, uh, you're going to see a lot of gaps in your ink because those pencil lines were holding together a lot of the forms. And so generally, you have to go touch up afterward. The eraser didn't get rid of the ink. It's just ink was never placed in some areas, though it looked like it may have been. So beginners typically have to go touch up. That's where your line weight happens. That's where, you know, refining some of your edges happens and even adding more detail occurs at the end. How do you ink? We call it pulling a line. You pull a line. When you pull an inked line, that's called a stroke. A stroke must occur as one single, confident, clean line. That's very difficult for beginners to achieve because some of you may not have controlled your arm yet, learned how to, and you might use chicken scratches when you draw. Well, that's not how you ink. You need to commit to one line like that. And it's very unforgiving. If that line wobbles, there's no erasing. It's permanent. So here's what I recommend that you do. You need to use your body mechanic the way we learned, where you lock the wrists, lock the fingers, and you're going to use the elbow swivel. And what you want to do is descend like an airplane, let the nib hit the ground, draw your line. And when you start to feel a loss of control, take off from the runway, right? That will cause the lines to taper at the end. To taper means that they come to a point. And then when you need to draw another line to continue, or another stroke to continue the line, land the plane again, only this time on the original line. And then where they taper together, they will meet and you'll have a continuous line. So let's look over here. Here's a very hard shape to draw, or a very hard line to ink. You know, we got a straight line, which is easy, but then it's going to curve. So the question is, is how many strokes do you need to use in order to get this inked and to get it clean? And um, the beginner should use as few strokes as possible. Okay. Me myself, I can I can do it probably in two. So I would ghost a couple of times to get a feel for the line. Then I would drop it, and then about here I would start to feel a loss of control. And then I would lift up, take off, and you see that would result in a tapered edge. Now to get this other edge, I would ghost and practice the stroke and then drop it about here. The tapered edges would overlap, creating a clean, consistent, straight line. And I would just continue around. Uh, three strokes could work. Rotate your paper so that you don't need to change the angle of your arm. That makes inking way easier. Uh, whether you go in to out or pull towards you, you know, it, it's up to you. Uh, personally, I find moving in to out 
drawing away from my body uh, works better with my uh, body mechanic. We talked about tapering. All right, bad technique. So avoid, actually don't just avoid, just don't do it. Just don't do chicken scratches. That sketchiness that happens when you're using a pencil, just don't do it. Uh, if you're gonna make a line, make a line. But do not do multiple little lines and expect your viewer to think that it looks clean. Uh, that tells us, oh man, this person doesn't know what they're doing, all right? So commit to a stroke and follow through. Uh, wobbles happen when you overcommit. So when you start to feel a loss of control, that's when you should lift up and reset, right? Um, when you start to wobble, you know, students generally don't care, just keep going because they want to get it done and it looks really cruddy. So over committing your strokes and going outside the range of your control is what you want to avoid. And then broken lines. If you go to reattach your lines and you end up with two lines, two strokes that make two separate lines instead of two strokes that make one line, uh, that's another beginning beginner mistake. Um, so with that, let's move on to line weight. What is line weight? Line weight is the principle of making contour lines thicker or thinner to achieve a specific effect in different situations. So that basically means sometimes your lines are going to get thick, sometimes they're going to get thin, and there are reasons why you would want to get thicker and thinner lines. All right. So if we look over here, uh, we've got some areas have very thick lines, there are other areas have very thin lines, and they follow a rule, or actually three basic rules. And that is done with consistency throughout the piece. Same thing over here in this really high detail character turnaround. Um, some of the areas that are in front of others and bulked up, you know, they have thicker lines. And let's take a look at those three rules. So rule number one, the three beginner rules of line weight. When two forms intersect each other, the closest form gets the heavier line. Now that's all around the form, okay? When two forms intersect, the closest form gets the heavier line. Areas with less light receive a heavier line. So the underside of the closest form gets a heavier line. The underside of the back form gets a heavier line because we're assuming the light source is above. Also, rule number one is in effect here for the top form. It gets a heavier line as well. So that means its shadow-like line is going to be thicker than the shadow-like line of the one behind it. And the third rule, oftentimes for emphasis, if you have a form in front of a lot of stuff, you sometimes want to bulk up the line weight to make it stand out. Otherwise, it would get lost. So let's back up to this other image of a guinea pig robot. It might be a little difficult to see, but you see the edge of the front of the nose of the robot that goes down to the pelvis, right? Well, there is a very broad, thick line here. And that's because this entire plane is in front of the hand and in front of the leg. I needed to bulk up the thickness of this profile in order to separate these two planes from here. Otherwise, the viewer might think that it's part of one mass and become confusing. All right. So again, two forms intersect. Closest form gets the heavy line. Areas with less light get the heavy line. And then sometimes you need to bulk up the outside of a thing so that it stands out from the rest. So let's look at some common beginner mistakes with detail, and that will wrap our lesson. So what I generally see from beginners is that the details, they are flat. Your details must follow the perspective of the 3D form. So for example, if you're gonna make a mummy and we are taller than the mummy, then we're going to see the direction of the lines going a certain direction to curve around the mummy, all right? If you're gonna do the side corner of a brick wall and you're gonna do the right side and the left side, your bricks should follow perspective. Right side converges to right VP, left side converges to left VP. Your bricks should converge to the right VP on the right side. Your bricks on the left side should converge to left VP. Another detail I often see is overdoing it. So a lot of times uh, we need, you don't wanna fill the whole thing up with details. The most essential areas that you'll put the details in should be the closest corner over here. And then you start to fade out some of the details. So you don't have to spend five hours on just one wall, right? Drawing every single little brick. Uh, no, your, your public, your viewer is smart enough to get the point. 
if you add some details and then have the bricks kind of start to come apart, not be as designed, not, not be fully drawn as they get further and further away. Uh, no detail forms remain geometric. And by that, I mean, we're not putting skin on top of this that says brick, right? Let's look at this corner. See this corner is a straight line. Okay. Now, let's look here. Look at the front corner. See how I've staggered the corner to match what's going on with the actual bricks? Okay, so um, we're not just putting skin on top of this. Details change the surface volume and the space as well, right? So if you're going to put a window on something, that window should be sunken in because windows don't just stay flush up against the outside of a, of a wall, right? So, um, so your details should be changing both the form and having information in, as, as to like what that material is and how it works. Another common beginner mistake, no line weight. You must have line weight if you're going to be inking. Otherwise, it's going to look really, really bad. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, beginners typically really uh, take some shortcuts here. Uh, my students who are functional and manage their time well don't run into this issue. They have strong line weight. Uh, my, my students who are you know either falling behind due to whatever laziness, not using their time wisely, and they find themselves in a crutch rather than getting caught up, they uh, you know just rush it, and it comes out in their grade. So line weight. Use it. Incorrect line weight. So we should be seeing some consistency here. Notice this building is in front of this building. This building is in front of this building. Why is the building that's in the back, why does it have the thickest line weight? I don't understand. It just looks really bad. So don't go there. Use the rules correctly. Sloppy inking. So here we've got chicken scratches and really bad inking work. We've got scribbles. And over here, we got over committing and wobbles, right? Uh, the student would have, for these straight lines, they would have been a little better off with a couple of things. I think if they had more detail, that would have busted the form up a little more so they wouldn't have to commit to such huge strokes. And they should have used a ruler also. If you're in a situation where you're gonna ink a big straight line, use a ruler. Nothing wrong with that. I would not wanna be a student forced to use a ruler on a thing that has tons of detail, that would be a nightmare. I mean, your arm is built to do straight lines anyway, um, if they're small enough. But yeah, sloppy inking. Just uh, be very mindful of what you're doing. Be careful. Like notice the student drew through their wall over here, right? <laughs> Some of the strokes are, see, we got strokes that continue on that were never really turned into anything. It just looks bad. So um, use, use craftsmanship when you work. So this is actually a pencil drawing here. I didn't ink this, but uh, let's take a look at how the details are working. We touched on it a little earlier. Notice the detail is around the focal point. Right? This is the first place we're going to look, which is going to be the corner because it's about a wall. You know, it's about a wall coming to a point here. Um, you'll have to make the decision based on your piece on where your focal point is um, in the piece. Now, you don't just pick an area and start doing tons of detail. you got to look at, well, where are you guiding the person? What's the story about? Where is the main idea located in it? And if you don't have one, you should probably you better get one. All right. You should probably put one in there. And then you could do, go do your details after that. So notice my bricks. I, I, I quit completing all of the bricks. But in some areas, I have seams that have that T-shaped brick-like look to it. Uh, they all follow perspective. I use line weight where it's necessary, and I suggest brick as I get farther away. That, that mean, that, that to suggest means you're not spelling everything out for your viewer. You're leaving some for their brain to fill in the gaps. And it saves you time, and it gives the eye room to rest, and it makes the piece less visually heavy. Uh, you know, Just imagine if all the bricks were drawn in here. It would be a very busy image. So that concludes our lesson today, everybody. Um, and I look forward to seeing you guys in class. Good luck with your cities. I look forward to seeing your completed creative cityscapes. All right, everybody. Take care.